All right, looks like we are live. Welcome everybody. My name's Scott. This is Drawing Together. Uh, this is brought to you by Artist Network. So um, we are, what, episode 53? I can't believe it. <laughs> so, so welcome everybody. I'm glad I could be here today. Um, this is what we're working on. This is a drawing of a, you know, we're really focusing on capturing a, a child's features in a portrait. And and in particular, contrasting it with the episode we did last Wednesday. So um, you can look back through, I believe it was episode 51, um, if you're, if you're kind of catching up with us, but really kind of looking at the difference in, in age and how do we capture age in a portrait. So um, a lot that I learned in doing this preparatory sketch um, if you're new, you're going to want to know that you can find the reference image in the description below. Now, links don't work in a YouTube description, so you have to copy and paste it into your browser. There's also a link to the Artist Network Drawing Together page for this episode where you can share your work uh, once you've you followed along. So once you're done with it, share it up there. I love seeing everybody's work. It is awesome. I've seen a lot of growth uh, throughout the whole series. And in myself, as I've been reflecting on this whole series, um, I found that things have really kind of sped up for me. I'm able to um, kind of react to things more quickly and achieve um, kind of a stronger drawing more quickly over time. And that's really the goal here is to, you know, to improve our drawing skills. So let's dig right into it. As you can see, this drawing was done on tone paper. It's the same materials as I used on when, uh, Monday, I'm sorry, um, using this gray toned paper. Um, if you're wondering, <clears throat> It's this Strathmore toned gray paper, 80 pound. I think it works great for uh, these purposes. Um, it occurred to me that um, if, you're, if you have charcoal available, that it works really well for this, if you have black and white charcoal. Um, but today I'm actually gonna be using my ebony pencil as well as this Creta Color Nero pencil, or if you have a black drawing pencil of another brand, that will work, as well as this pastel chalk white pencil. Um, to bring in some of the highlights. I've got my two shading stumps, one that I have kind of built up a lot of material on. So this is going to be used for the darks. This is going to be used for the whites when I need it. Um, and then I have my erasers. I got my trusty kneaded eraser, um, my rubber eraser, which I've kind of uh, taken a razor blade to to sharpen up some of the edges and kind of clean off some of it. And then I have this plastic eraser that I'm playing around with to see how that impacts things. So this is a nine by 12 sheet of paper. Um, actually, before I put this away, one of the things that I found in doing the preparatory one is, you can see how this is smaller. This started out as a nine by 12. Um, and as I was laying things out, I ended up shrinking the features a bit and then doing some cropping in afterwards. So that may be something that you experience as well. So I'm gonna to try to actually utilize the full sheet today um, and kind of focus on composition a little bit more um, so that I don't have to crop it, but just kind of, um, I wanted to put that out there that what had happened is that I showed too much of the space below and without any sort of information about the mouth in the reference photo, it felt uncomfortable and awkward. So how we crop this is actually going to play more of a role than perhaps some of the other drawings that we've worked on. So um, let's dig right into it. I see some questions already, so I want to address them before we get started. Cubs Win is asking, what is the equivalent graphite pencil to an ebony? I'd say if you have a 6B or an 8B, that's probably going to work. This is a very soft um, uh, pencil here. Um, and they, there are kind of gradations that I've seen um, with ebony pencils. Some are much more dark than others, but it's, it's still a graphite material. So if you have a, a soft one, like a 6B or an 8B, that should work out well for you. Um, lots of people identifying where you're from. It's awesome to see people from all over the place. So um, let's see, I wanted to just scroll through. There's, this, there's a lot going on. So I really like seeing all the engagement here, but I wanna make sure I'm not missing any questions. Um, if you do have questions and if you're new, um, it's helpful to type them in all caps so that I can identify them more easily. So, all right, so let's dig right into it. Now, one of the things that I had explored in the earlier version of this is that I realized that the cropping of the photo that you have, so if you follow the link in the description, you bring up the photo, there's show, it's showing a bit more of the forehead. What you're seeing on the screen below me um, has been cropped just a little bit more, cutting off more of the forehead. And that comes into play as we start to lay out 
the features because in the reference photo, in the full reference photo, the eyes are really more in the center. In the image right below me, it is, it's kind of raised up a little bit more. So what I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna use the reference image that I see on the screen right now, the one that's right below me, with the eyes a little bit higher, a little bit larger, um, and, and I think that's what's going to help me with the overall proportions. Um, what I, what I'm, what are good, it's like helpful to do is establish an axis for the eyes. Um, now, as with everything, as you start to lay down your marks, be willing to always adjust them. Um, what, I, what I've seen some students struggle with is in laying things out, assuming that things are correct and in in aligning everything with that. So if, uh, establishing an axis, for example, for the eyes and then not changing that. Um, there's a high likelihood that this angle is incorrect. So I want to kind of keep playing around with it, but right now I just want to get information on the page. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm establishing a line for the eyes and a line for the nose. And I want to make sure that those are parallel with one another. Um, in that preparatory one that I had I worked on, that threw me off. I kept drawing the nose at a different angle than the eyes and then having to adjust that as we went. So I wanna to try to get ahead of that this time and learn from my mistakes earlier on. So as I'm laying out these, the axis here, what I'm doing is, is I'm looking at this, the screen in front of me that has the reference image as well as what this camera above me is capturing. And, and so I can see my drawing and the reference image side by side. And as I keep my eyes fixed on the reference image, I'm trying to visualize the angle and out of my peripheral vision, I'm looking at the movement of my pencils, my pencil to see that it aligns with the angle that I'm observing. And I'm, you know, I can do some angle sighting, so align with, I'm closing one eye, aligning my pencil with the eyes and then comparing it to the drawing. And, and this also is helping me to visualize where these features are gonna go. Um, oh, Jenna's asking, uh, thank you for catching that. Um, white paper I think will work out just fine. Actually, the, um, I wanted to bring up this drawing. So this is the drawing we did last Wednesday. This was drawn on white paper. And the reason I chose gray for this, it was brought up during this live session um, in that with the white of the paper being more dominant, it's kind of washing out the highlights. I'm not getting that punch from the highlights and the eyes that I saw present in the reference photo. So that's why I shifted to this gray. So we can really kind of compare those two processes. So if you're working on white paper, you can, you can apply so much of what we're gonna to cover today on that. It's just more of an additive process, you know, where you're, you're adding the, the dark to it, using your eraser to pull out the highlights, but just know that you might try to bring the, the value down a little bit farther um, than you might feel comfortable with. And it might be helpful to see it in the context of this gray paper. Um, you can see just like this isn't a, like a middle gray, but it's a darker gray and it's going to allow us to pull those highlights out a little bit more. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Thomas is asking if uh, I have a white chalk pastel and white or a chalk pastel and white and a white Conte. Will they work? They should work just fine. Um, so those are going to work out well for you. This is a pastel chalk that I've got here. I also found that I have a, a white charcoal that I might use today. See how that works as well. So, all right. So back to this. And now once I have the, the axis uh, established here, um, I want to establish the placement of the nose. And in the reference photo, I've got a larger one off to my left here. So that's what I'm looking at is I'm, I'm evaluating the bridge of the nose and it's a, generally it's right smack in the middle of the paper. So that puts that right about here. All right, and I just wanna make sure that that line is generally perpendicular. Now this is slight, a slightly different approach to building the drawing than what we've worked on before. In the past, I built by establishing the shapes of the light and the dark. And that's what I did in my preparatory sketch is just starting by looking for the abstract shapes of the dark areas, but I got thrown off 
by not having established these the axes here. Um, and then I had to kind of go back and correct things. So that's why I'm kind of flipping the script a little bit more here. Um, so now that I have some basic orientation, I can start to block in some of the shapes of the darks. And I'm using the side of the ebony pencil so that I get these broad marks. And I'm kind of just reacting to the form, getting information on the page. Um, it's, you know, one of the, the things that we've talked a lot about in this series is that in the initial stage in the drawing, it's, it's all about reacting to the subject, getting information on the page, so that you have something uh, that will allow you to make specific decisions about what needs to change. And so I'm not being very precise, but I, I, this is really more gestural. Uh, but once I get this information on the page, then I can look at it and, and see where do I need to change. Uh, so in my primary focus right now is looking for the abstract shapes formed by the areas of dark in those shadow areas. So squinting your eyes at, at this point really helps. It prioritizes value relationships. It kind of um, it makes those darker areas darker, the lighter areas lighter, creates a little bit more contrast so you can see the shapes of light and the dark a little bit more easily. Um, and so if we look here for the, along the bridge of the nose, for example, or the shadow cast by the nose, it's an interesting form. We have really a kind of distinct triangular shape here, kind of towards the bottom. And it kind of elongates, and then there's, it kind of aligns with somewhat of a crescent shape here. And then as we go through, I'm gonna to start to correct these forms. And now, now I, as I have, I'm starting to establish this shape here, you can see that I didn't, I didn't put the, the eyes right on that axis. Um, and I may need to move things around a little bit, but it's, it's really more to, in order to have some sort of guideline that I'm orienting. So this, this ultimately is started, starting to align more with the brow than anything. And I'm kind of getting caught between two photos right now. I'm kind of switching back and forth between what I see on the screen and the full image. And I think that's throwing me off. So at this stage, uh, what I think I need to do is choose one over the other. I think I want to actually... And use the one that's on the screen in front of me. One of the things we talked about in this series as well is the ugly duckling stage. <laughs> I have a feeling I'm going to be going through an ugly duckling stage on this one. Um, so as, as you're going through, um, you know, just be aware that, you know, if, if there's going to be a messy stage as you're trying to figure things out, and that's very normal and desirable, you know, I think that's really, it's healthy to, um, to go through that, through that phase. You know, in, in my mind, drawing requires, or kind of facilitates a certain sense of fighting for it. Uh, not against it, but just, you know, kind of there's, I think there's a struggle that you go through that can sometimes be helpful to embrace. And it's part of what, in this, in this process of just getting information down on the page, and part of it, what happens is, is that at some point, at some point the mind kind of flips and you can start to see the portrait take shape on the page and then you're reacting to something a little bit differently. You know, from, you know, so it's like there's a transition period from letting the reference photo lead to then the drawing lead. Um, and then the, you know, the, the portrait that is emerging um, and kind of reacting to that. And so we're, we're trying to, at this point, 
identify, you know, what are, what are the key elements that are really essential for this. So I'm looking just for the abstract shapes of light and dark. This is all very sketchy at this point. But it's all in the service of just getting information down so then I can go through and make calculated decisions about what needs to change. Um, and as you're, as you're going through, be mindful of the, the symbol systems, the, the preconceived notions that we might bring to a drawing about how to draw something, what an eye looks like, how we draw an eye. And, and at this stage, it's really all about trying to see the abstract qualities of the, of the subject so that we don't get bogged down in the specifics. We're not being you know, led by an, some sort of um, you know, like preconceived idea about how, we, how something should be drawn based on what we've drawn in the past. We, we tend to build up kind of a muscle memory for drawing um, and sometimes that's helpful and sometimes that works against us. And I found that in the, in the, the um, when drawing portraits in particular, that, you know, I get, I, that muscle memory kicks in and I just start drawing a portrait based on what I've, what I've worked on before, not what's really in front of me. Okay. So you can start to see the rough forms taking place here. Now there are a few things that I'm seeing uh, in the, the eyes, for example, they're not quite aligning along the axis. So I can go through and start to make some more specific decisions. I think I need to bring this, this eye up. And so what I'm doing is I'm using the smaller version of the reference photo to, to guide my layout while well, I'm going to use the larger version that's over here to my left to work on the specifics once I have everything mapped out properly. Just want to see the nose. So one of the things that I, I like to look at now is look at the width of the eyes that I've started to establish. I've got this eye here it's equivalent to this eye here. Now I need to determine the spacing between them. So if I look at the reference photo and I gauge the width of this, this eye here that's on my right, the child's left eye, the distance between the eyes is just slightly larger than the width of the eye itself. So if I take this and carry this across, what I've established here is too close together. It, it's, that, that distance is shorter than the width of the eye itself. So now I have to make a decision. What is off at this point? Do I bring, do I make the eye smaller? Which I think I might be able to do a little bit. Or do I make that smaller? Or, and then kind of adjust from there. So let's see. If I've, what I'm doing is kind of indicating the, the edges of the eyes, those, those key points there, and then adjusting from there. So I'm taking this distance, carrying it across, adding a little bit of space over here to the left because there's a bit more of a gap between those, a little bit wider than one eye width, and then adjusting from there. If I take this, carry this across, that would suggest that the, the eye over here kind of ends right here. Hopefully that makes sense. Now evaluating the uh, um, evaluating the axis to make sure that that's working. Need to be able to see that a little bit more. I think that works out okay. And then this nose down here can come down a little bit. So I just want to make sure that I establish that axis across the bottom of the nose so that they 
stay parallel with one another. Uh, oh, Dillard Parker is asking, do you site size or use guidelines? I mean, a site size is a lot. I mean, I do a lot of comparative measuring. It's not always site size, um, but essentially site size is, is trying to correlate a one-to-one -one relationship between the subject and the drawing. Um, and that works out best with uh, an easel setup so that you have your subject and your drawing right next to one another and you can carry measurements from one to the, uh, to the other. Um, in this setup, it makes it a little, little bit more challenging to use a site size process, but um, I do, I think comparative measuring is really critical and angle sighting. So getting the angles right and making sure the relationship between those proportions is correct. Uh, I'm just going to start to rough in the iris and pupil so that I have something there. Using the side of the pencil again, because I, I want to try to avoid lines as much as possible and I can start to see them forming. Um, but I, I want to be thinking in terms of um, in terms of shape as much as possible. All right. I'm going to grab my shading stump and start to kind of build from there a little bit more. So remember when you're using a shading stump, it's not just about kind of smoothing out a texture. This is an opportunity to, con to contribute to the form. Um, and kind of getting back to that site size method, you know, one of the things that I you can kind of carry over from that in this is that there's so much happening in terms of um, kind of blending your observation of the reference photo with your drawing. So as I'm looking at the reference, I'm putting part of my mind, my awareness on the drawing. When I'm looking at the drawing, the other part of my awareness is on the reference photo. I'm trying to see both of them at the same time uh, so that I don't get sucked into one or the other. So as I'm you know, working on the shadow, for example, I'm looking at the reference photo to establish the, the angle and the shape that I'm observing, but I'm I'm also have a part of my awareness on the drawing and what's happening in my peripheral vision, kind of glancing at the page to make sure I'm oriented properly to the the drawing. Uh, as I'm looking at the shape of the shadow here, I'm trying to be aware of of a plumb line. If I were to draw a vertical line from the edge of the shadow, where does it intersect the eye? And I want to make sure that that correlates. It looks like that's pretty close. It kind of just it comes in just underneath. This, this side of the, the pupil, I'm sorry, the iris. And in, in a way, kind of getting back to that point, it, it starts to feel like tracing. And if you're, if you're moving back and forth between the reference photo and the drawing kind of quickly, event, at some point, it's like your brain merges the two together and it starts to feel almost like you're tracing as you're drawing. And in this case, I think one of the challenges is the fact that I have multiple references. Now in some other, I always have two references because I have the full image on the screen here, plus I have what you're seeing, which is the small one directly below me. Um, I'm always using those things, but in this one, uh, for some reason, it's, it's becoming more of a challenge to manage those two. So we're going to be building up with the grays, then adding the highlights later. And as I'm doing that, I'm observing a general shift between light and dark. Uh, so even though we see highlights over here, on average, this side is darker than this side. And so I need to evaluate the tone of the paper and how that correlates with the, uh, the overall value shift that I'm observing. So I may drop down the value here, push that a little bit more. Uh, Patty, you're asking about the white paper. Um, if you're using white paper, I think the process is going to be very similar to what we used last Wednesday. Um, so what, what you might do is you might try toning the whole page with the graphite um, and then erase out the highlights 
just know that, that those erased highlights are probably not going to be quite as intense as you'd like them to be. So you might need to go back in on top with a pastel or a white uh, chalk or a, um, a white pastel to, um, to bring out those highlights. Uh, the, one of the things that I also want to kind of remind everybody is, is when you're looking at curves, try to break them into sections of short straight marks that then will kind of accumulate together uh, to create the curve that you're looking for. So I'm seeing a kind of this subtle curve here in that shadow cast by the nose as we go into that eye socket. Uh, um, and then there's, you know, sections within that. Uh, try to break those apart, and as, as we look for the shape of the eyes, we could do the same thing. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to look specifically at this shape and not get sucked into that symbol system that says to draw an eye like this, a curve on top and bottom, and they're symmetrical. This, this is a very asymmetrical form, each of these eyes. You can see that the steeper here kind of levels out a little bit, and then there's a pretty strong angle this direction. And as we look at that lower eyelid, it kind of comes across. We have a gentle kind of dip here and then a general angle, he angle here. And in, and in general with the shape of the eye, if you look at the iris and use that as a guide, on the upper eyelid, its highest point is going to be on the inside of that iris. On the lower eyelid, that lowest point is going to be on the outside of that iris. And that's just a general kind of observation about the shape of eyes, but you want to always be checking that against your subject, um, but it can be something that's helpful to observe. I don't like that angle. And what I like about using the shading stump at this point is that it, it makes kind of softer marks that are going to be easier to, to get, you know, adjust later. And I don't like those lines. That's going to throw me off. This is kind of darker. I'm going to wrap around. I don't like that line there. So I need to kind of adjust that. I need to be careful about that. Um, and if you're new to the series, um, you just know that I, I welcome observations that are constructive about the drawing. Um, you all as a community have come to, to my rescue more than once when working with portraits just to call out certain things. And that's part of why we're here to draw together is, uh, you know, we can um, kind of share our observations. So if you're working on your own drawing and there's something that you're learning about the whole process, um, then, you know, share that with the group. If there's something that you're seeing happening in my drawing, um, feel free to call that out. Uh, what I want to do now is I'm establishing the, the nostrils here. And what can be helpful is to use the eyes as a, as a reference. So in this case, if I drop a plumb line down from this inner portion of the eye here, it aligns directly with this left side of the nostril. And if I do another plumb line um, th with this eye, this nostril comes in right at about here. I'm going to start looking at these basic shapes of the nostrils here. You know, one of the things that we battle when working with nostrils is that we know that there's a particular round quality to them, but we think about the underside of the nose more as a shelf, and we're looking across those kind of ellipses of the nostrils, and that makes these really thin slivers of marks. So we want to look closely at the individual shapes that we see taking place there that form the nostril. So. All right. Oh, there's, this is really throwing me off here. That, so I need to make some adjustments here. This needs to come together a little bit more, a little bit more shallow. There we go. Um, all right. So we're building the whole drawing up. I think we can start to refine things a bit more. Uh, I'm pretty happy with the composition. Uh, I think it's going to be helpful to establish kind of the side of the head. 
and that'll, that'll help to kind of define the overall proportions of this child. And just remember, before you make a mark, be, always be checking in with other points of reference in the drawing. So for example, the ear, as I start to draw the ear, it's easy to get isolated in this one area, look at the shape of the ear and try to draw that. But do a quick check-in to see where that ear is relative to the nose. And it looks like a, as a horizontal line is directly in line with the nose. And that's a general rule in portrait drawing is that you know the ears are about as tall as the distance between the eyes and the nose, but depending on the tilt of the head, it could, could vary. So you want to always be kind of double checking those things. Uh, I see a value shift here, almost a vignetting where it gets a little bit darker up in this corner. I can start to layer that in. Oh, the height of the eyes. Yeah, so um, I'm using the, the reference image that's just below me on the screen right now as a guide for the composition where the eyes are placed a little bit higher in the composition. Um, the reference photo has them more centered, so that's something you want to be aware of. Um, and then as we look at the kind of the height of, the, of each eye, you can compare it to the width. And so one of the things I'm observing is that this eye in the reference photo, if you take the highest um, the length there, the height of the highest point, and, and turn it to its side, it equates to about uh, twice, the, the, the width is about twice as much as the height. So let me double check that again. Actually, it's more about two and a half. So I take this dimension here, turn it, and you get one, two, and a half to the width ratio. So the ratio is one height to two and a half widths. Um, and then that's a little bit, there's a little bit narrower, a little, a little bit shorter on this eye over here. Okay, so now I think what I want to do is I want to start to get some of these values established. And rather than go for kind of the gold of the going for the eyes, um, I want to, I think I want to build up some of the values around it. But as I'm looking at this, I, there still seems to be a misalignment here that I want to correct before I start to adjust. I think this eye needs to come down. I just want to make sure that those align properly, otherwise it's really going to throw things off. Now, what, what I'm not, also what I'm observing here that, I, that I'm not as happy with is this distance here. So how can I fix that? Let's see. All right. Take this. It's pretty, okay, it's pretty close. I think what I'm trying to figure out is the spacing between the nose and try to figure out what the correct proportion. So. If I take this distance of this eye, what I see in the reference photo is that's equivalent to the distance between this nostril and kind of the center of the eye here. So I'm pretty close, but I think I need to bring that up or maybe bring the eyes down. Something needs to shift here. And what do I need to do? I think my best option is actually to bring the eyes down. So <laughs> this is going to... Uh, this is it's hurting me right now because I don't want to do this, but it needs to happen. It's, it's one of those things that's going to bother me if I don't. 
Um, and it's just, it's part of the drawing process. I gotta make these corrections here. I need to bring this eye down and close up some of that, that distance. And I think, I, I think I'd rather have a bit more of that forehead showing than raise the nose up where I don't have any information. I can't make up the mouth there, I can't see it. And so I'm gonna leave that, I'm gonna lock that down and I'm gonna move the eyes down a little bit, so. Um, and Gracia, you don't necessarily need to start with a print out of the reference photo. If you can bring it up on a screen, I feel like that's just as effective. Or you can be drawing from the screen, you know, the, uh, right you know, with the, the reference image right below me. Oh, uh, JC, I meant about the iris height, something about the inside and outside. Yeah, let me try, I'll see if I can, when I get back to that point, I'll see if I can um, remember. Uh, I think what you might be looking at is that the, the, the iris sits a little bit higher in the eye than we, it's not perfectly centered between the upper and lower eyelids. It's a little bit higher, the upper eyelid comes down a bit more so that the pupil is closer to that upper eyelid. The iris sits a little bit higher um, in general. So that may be what we're, what you're talking about here. So I mentioned earlier the ugly duckling stage. <laughs> we're definitely at that right now as I have all of these lines now converging, but um, I, I think it's really important that I fix uh, I fixed some of these, uh, the, the placement of these forms here uh, in order to really achieve that, that likeness. It's going to, by creating too much space there, it's going to throw everything off. Um, I'm going to come across here, look at the axis. And then this eye is going to come back down a bit more. I'm going to lower that. how much lower this eye is gonna come. In the, in the preparatory sketch, this is where, um, this is where I got thrown off. What I ended up doing was cropping the drawing, uh, and I could have, I guess I could have done that here um, but rather than crop the drawing, I feel like it's, it's more valuable and helpful to see how to how to correct it, move things around on the page. All right, that's I'm just comparing the ang I'm just looking at the axis of the eyes. All right, and we're gonna, I'm gonna see how that comes together. It's kind of this ghostly form right now, so I think I need to add a little bit of clarity so it doesn't throw me off. Um, kind of sharpen up this form a little bit. So as I'm drawing with the, ir drawing the iris here, I'm also trying to be aware of the negative space, of the white of the eyes. Uh, and the same with over here. I think this needs to come up a little bit more here. I have to say that was rather intimidating to make that decision, <laughs> just to shift the eyes down a little bit. But I think it's, like I said, I think it's gonna be important and it's gonna play out well in the end. All right, that feels better right there. So I'm just evaluating now the distance between the eye, uh, the eyes and the nose. So in the grand scheme of things, it didn't add a whole lot more time to this whole drawing, but I think it's gonna make it better in the end. And luckily I made that change before I really committed and started to, um, you know, started to render the features more. All right, 
and pull out the shading stump. Mary Jo is saying, you've already moved the left eye three times. Awesome. Uh, Aida is asking, if you were to paint this in pastel, do you have to draw it first with charcoal or graphite? Honestly, I, uh, working in pastel, I don't think I would be drawing it in pastel, uh, in graphite or charcoal. I would probably be using uh, a color. I would probably actually try to define a mid-tone, um, you know, something between a shadow and a highlight to lay that in. So then I can push the darks and the shadows darker and the highlights out from that. But I don't. I haven't really done any portraiture in um, in pastel, so to kind of take that with a, a grain of salt there. Um, you know, somebody. We have a video series on Artist Network uh, that's done uh, by um, Alan Picard. He has a whole video, a couple of videos on drawing portraits in pastel, and one of them is on getting you know, various flesh tones, and he has a really solid process for establishing that. So I might want to review that before I offer kind of more specific suggestions. But I don't believe he uses charcoal to, or graphite to block in things before kind of filling it in. I think he goes straight for the, uh, straight for the, the color. All right, so starting to add a little bit more definition. And I think one of the things that kind of comes to mind with this whole process is that, you know, we cycle around the drawing. We're always kind of coming back to something. It's not a matter of finishing one area, then moving on to the next. Um, we're darting around the whole drawing as much as possible. Nell is saying that yours already looks like an old man, so let's try to fix that. So we haven't really gotten into any observations about what, what do we see in the shapes here in the forms that define this as a child. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind for me is particularly in the lower eyelid, there's much less of, there's, it's much less substantive. There's less to kind of dig into in terms of texture there. Uh, comparing that to the drawing that we did last Wednesday of the man. Um, and then also right in here, it's just a smoother transition. These, these creases um, are just smoother. So one of the things that also observe, and I think it's, it's really kind of important to observe, is when you look at the sphere of the eyeball, you know, it's, you know we have a light and dark side here, uh, or light and shadow side. And as we look at these, the crease here, we can see that a shift in that line where we come into the eye socket and as we come around the outer side of that eyeball, then that upper eyelid actually folds in on top of that and comes forward there. Um, and then, it, we, then this crease kind of emerges on the back side out here. So really kind of pay attention to the, the, the fluctuation of in and out, the way that line kind of moves in and out. Um, so that it's not just a solid curve, but there's some sort of dimension to it. All right, I'm gonna bring out this black drawing pencil and I think I just kind of work with this for a while. There's this kind of darker furrow in the brow that is too high. I think I'm drawing, I'm looking at that space here and it seems too great. So let me, I didn't move that. When I moved the eye down, I didn't move that, that furrow accordingly. And drawing really is a, it's a kind of a network of marks. And in particular drawing eyes, it's about drawing the whole system not just any one feature. Just um, just looking here, Mary Jo, I gotta move the nose up. Yeah, everything kind of shifts around, doesn't it? Um, it's That's the part that I really have the hardest time with is it's just getting that placement right. And it's so easy in a portrait for things to shift. 
you know, as we start to lay things out, you know, we, it, it's easy for things to kind of move up or down just slightly. I'm looking at this transition into the dark here and making it a little bit softer. But I wanted to find where that, that line of termination here, where we're, we go into that shadow, where that exists. So I'm just using the side of the pencil, kind of leaning into the point when I need to uh, bear down a little bit more when I need a darker mark and I need to fill in some of that texture. One of the things that I'm also observing here is I follow along the contour of that upper eyelid, really paying attention to the edges. It's softer where some of the eyelashes are. So I don't want to be inventing something that doesn't exist. So if I squint my eyes, I think it helps me to see the form a little bit better. And really just trusting the abstract shapes. A little bit of light right here. So there's a bit of a positive negative space drawing taking place. So I'm looking at the shape of the dark, then also the shape of the light. Um, Dillard, what you are referring to in the eye is the spherical quality and rendering in the eye. Exactly. So I think the big thing in drawing the eye, and that's what Dillard was saying, is talking about the, the sphere of the eye. You know, as we're, as we're, so we're looking at this, really keeping in your mind the idea that the, the, the ball is a sphere, it's in a socket, then there's bone around that, there's muscle and flesh as well. And so uh, we're looking at these multiple layers of, um, of stuff that's built on top of this sphere. And so if you can see the spherical quality of it, and we're gonna, we're gonna dig into that here, especially with the eye, um, is, uh, is how, to, how to create that. You know, we're going to be bringing in some of that white chalk a little bit later to reinforce the rounded quality of that eyeball. This is where, you know, I could have chosen charcoal to work with for this. Instead, I've just got this, this black drawing pencil, and I think it works out all right. So there's... There's some tooth to the paper that's showing through, and I could ask myself, do I want to get rid of that or not? Okay. I'm just kind of looking, kind of moving back and forth, um, kind of reorienting myself to the eye. I think I need to provide a little bit more structure there. Um, sorry, I'm kind of getting a little distracted right now. I can feel myself kind of darting all over the place. So I want to rein my thinking in a little bit, um, be a bit more focused. And I'm kind of stepping back, I'm looking at the, the um, the drawing in front of me as a way to kind of step back and evaluate. All right. I need to bring up a little bit more value here just to provide some more structure to make sure everything is it's looking good. There's another dark spot here that is a little slight furrow to the brow that um, provides a little bit of a landmark there that I want to establish. All right, so I'm feeling good about the overall proportions. Let's get in to start actually rendering some of that form a little bit more. Now we can kind of start to move towards the shading, or the, again, the finishing phase. 
want to darken this because as I squint, I can really see how this part here is in shadow, but I'm not seeing it in the drawing itself. So in, in the reference photo, I see a distinct light and shadow side. Um, Ethan is asking about color. In this one, there's not going to be any color established here, um, but I mean, it, it can be helpful to be kind of thinking about it in terms of tone. So if you are using charcoal, for example, there can be a particular um, uh, temperature shift, I guess, not necessarily tone, but temperature um, in that, you know, the gray that I have has a certain temperature to it is relative, relatively neutral in terms of its temperature, but sometimes I use a, a tan toned paper. Um, and the charcoal uh, will have a temperature, some, some are more warm and some are more cool. Graphite tends to be more cool. So in this case, again, we're not gonna be adding color, but it can be helpful to try to observe the temperature contrast. And then when we add the lights onto it, that can sometimes come into play as well. Smooth this out a little bit. Uh, so I'm seeing, you know, you can, you can see some definition, some light striking in here, but I can also, if I, if I look at this area, but put my awareness over here, I realize that this is still a darker in value, um, even though there's light hitting it. Um, so I want to be just kind of mindful of that. It's still kind of in shadow. There's just some variation in light and dark in there. And then looking at the shape, what I'm looking at is you can see a general line where that shadow starts, but I'm trying to observe its shape. So it's generally vertical here, and then it takes a slight angle and it starts to get dark in here. I'm looking for the kind of deeper shadow here. Looking for that shape. Constantly moving back and forth between the reference photo and the drawing. So I'm not getting kind of locked into the, the drawing too much. Now I build up some value here and you can already start to see some of that reflected light becoming apparent there. One of the things that you know, I see with some um, beginning drawing students is that once you become aware of uh, reflected light or bounce light in shadow areas, there's a tendency to overstate it. So you really want to be careful about that. If you squint your eyes at the reference photo, you know, you can, it, this all blends into generally one shadow shape. Uh, when you focus on it, then you start to see uh, that variation where you see a little bit of light bouncing out there. Uh, just you want to make sure that your drawing reads in such a way that that nostril stays in shadow. Uh, so as we come into here, I'm going to place the corner of that nostril. So what, what defines the shape of this nostril is this negative space, this cast shadow here. It's a bit of a sharper line on the inside where it aligns with that, that nostril. Um, and you can see an edge along here, but it's not a sharp edge. So be careful not to make that, that line too sharp. Give it a little bit of a um, softer edge. It's dark under here. And if we look at the nostril, you can try to break it down into a sequence of short straight marks. So it's relatively horizontal right in this section. We, then we can break it into another stretch here at an angle and then it angles downward again even more. And then if we look at that, that shadow here, it's, it's sharper up at this edge 
and then gets a little bit softer towards the bottom. And you can see right in this area, there's a little bit of light bouncing up underneath there. So there's a little bit brighter, then it gets a little bit darker and then we have light catching in here. So, but I want, like I just said, I want to be careful about that area because this, this whole area is still in shadow. So even those lighter spots are relatively dark and our eyes are really good at seeing subtle value shifts. So I want to be careful not to overstate some of those observations. So just as you look in this area, be, just be really careful not to overstate some of those light areas. But we do want to see uh, the value shift as we move, especially along this, the underside of that nostril, that, sh that shelf of the, the nostril, the nose. And as we come under here, there's a little bit of a, a value shift here. This is, this is kind of a cylindrical form of that upper lip where this part's not quite as direct, directly facing the light, so. Hello from India in the UK. Yeah, Nia is making some good observations about the pupil. Yeah, those are all gonna need to shift. And right now I can also see that the irises are different sizes, so I need to adjust just those when I get there. But keep those observations coming. It helps keep me in track because one of the things that'll that'll happen is I'll I'll kind of have in my mind, oh, I need to address whatever, and then I forget all about it. So <laughs> it's helpful to have you all kind of uh, kind of keep me in check with some of those areas. Now looking over at this nostril again, it's a little just a thin sliver of of dark. A little bit sharper on that topper edge and it becomes a little bit softer as we move down. And we're gonna really pull this out. We're gonna make this come to life when we start adding the, the light, the charcoal on top, the light pastel on top. So right there, I'm not gonna do a whole lot more to it. Okay. To smooth some of these things out. One of the things that I see happening is that um, with this material, there's a certain amount of reflectiveness that um, that becomes apparent when I look at the screen and I see what's actually being captured above me. Um, and so, I, I, you know, it looks one way from my perspective here. I'm looking at an angle. It looks a diff slightly different way from above. So I need to be able. To, I need to. Kind of keep that in mind and use the the image that you're seeing uh, of the overhead camera more okay so let's take a look at the irises here you can see that this one is quite a bit smaller so let me what do i need to do here i think i need to i think i need to bring this one in a little bit come in just a touch And then evaluate from there. Uh, I see a question about some of the highlight spots. Let me, let me, I want to, I haven't been able to read it um, very well. So let me, uh, can I get to that? So what I'm doing for the highlights, I'm going to kind of identify where they're going to be. And I'm just going to erase out an area. It's too large right now. I'm going to cut that back in. And we're going to go back in with a, um, with a, a white chalk to um, to clarify that. But right now, and again, moving my eyes back and forth quickly. And I think I'm feeling better about the size of this this pupil here. Now let me compare that to this one. All right, so generally, but it's generally it's in good shape, but I need to establish that. So one of the things we talked about 
in last week's portrait drawing as well, is just be mindful not to create too harsh of a line uh, on the outer edge of the iris. Um, I want just enough to establish it. I need to move this. I want, you want just enough to establish it, but it's generally a soft mark. So now looking at the pupil here, I want to make sure that it's generally consistent in size. And then looking at the placement, you can see the pupil is much closer to that upper eyelid. Um, that is, uh, that kind of reflects the, um, what I was saying earlier about the, the eye kind of sitting a little bit higher in the eye socket and in, in, in between the eyelids than we might naturally think. Dillard, thank you for the comment. <laughs> it is, it's interesting kind of talking through things while drawing. Um, but what's, what it's, I find that it's actually not too much of a challenge because this is really what my brain does when I'm drawing. I'm thinking through the same stuff. So it's just a matter of thinking out loud, essentially. So um, a lot of this is, is when, I, when I'm working is uh, me kind of narrating the process to kind of keep me in check so that I'm kind of present with the drawing and really thinking about what I'm doing. So I'm gonna kind of outline where the highlight's gonna be, but I wanna be careful not to overdo it. I want it to be a subtle line. I don't want that line to project forward, so I'm kind of sneaking up on it, but I'm gonna sharpen that up a little bit. And I think that's going to serve me when I add the, the white chalk later. Okay, I'm feeling better about this. I might have to sharpen this pencil at some point. Mariana, it seems like the child's iris takes up more room in the orb. In the, in the reference photo, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I can see that. I think I see what you mean. It does seem like in the reference photo, it takes up a bit more space. And in particular, as I look at this negative space, this is too, too large. So thank you for that observation. And that's gonna change things a little bit here. Gonna darken this whole thing up a little bit. And as I do that, let me see. Yeah, then this negative space also seems too large. Um, I'm feeling better about this negative space. That's going to shift the pupil over as well. Good observation. Yeah, that feels a little bit better overall. All right, so I think what I need to do is kind of clarify this. I'm going to get in and really start to add more refinement to this. So I'm going to start by the outer edge. Uh, as I look at this dark crease here, it's a relatively sharp edge, but it has a softness on the upper side of it. And I'm looking, again, keeping my eyes moving back and forth between the reference photo and the drawing, checking in on the screen in front of me um, that shows the overhead view. I'm observing this shape, how we have a strong shadow under here that's cast by the upper eyelid, and it kind of transitions into this thin kind of uh, shadow here on the lower eyelid. Now I'm looking at just the value relationships between the white of the eye and then this lower eyelid is a little bit darker along this ridge, but as we come down here, then there's a light edge that becomes more apparent. Well, oh, that didn't do much of anything, let's see. There we go. And as I look at this, I, I really wanna to try to observe that shelf of the lower eyelid. Um, and so as we come across here, it kind of rolls a little bit we come down and we can see onto that top edge a little bit more here. So a little bit light here and it transitions into 
somewhat of a shadow on that lower eyelid, and it particularly in particular it gets darker over here. There's a gradation across. So I'm trying to observe that. And then as I'm doing this, I'm also trying to hold in my mind what's going to be happening with the lights, where I'm going to add those. <laughs> They're saying, okay, good. So it's not weird that I talk to myself while working at a drawing. I don't think so at all. I don't know if it's, if, if it is weird, then I'm weird too. Um, I, I just, you know, I kind of do whatever it takes to, to pull myself into the moment because I know for myself, the, the drawings and paintings that have fallen apart or just where my mind is not in the game. And one of the things we've talked about in the series before is that marks are thoughts. This is, you know, the marks that I'm making here are influenced by us all being here together as I'm talking through all of this. Um, and your mental state will come through in the, the process. And there's some days where I'm just more focused and everything seems to be kind of firing all at once and comes together nicely. And other days my mind is somewhere else and the, it just falls apart, it doesn't come together. So, um, you know, then so there's a, sometimes you have to employ strategies to just get your head in the game, and one of them is kind of talking to myself. So, uh, as I'm looking at this, I'm trying to establish the overall value. If I squint at the, the iris, it on average, it's dark. But as I focus on it, you see all of these subtle variations in color, and it's so easy to be seduced by that. But let's try to get those values right right out the gate. I want to try to find that average value and then we're going to get in and add all of that kind of nice detail. So the upper eyelid casts a shadow over the eye so that can get a little dark. I want to define that pupil a little bit more. I think I'm going to have to sharpen this. Just want to make sure that it's centered. Then I think I need to kind of refine this shape a little bit more there. Um, this is, uh, Niha's asking about this pencil. This is a Krita-Color Nero pencil. And honestly, I don't know what the material is, but it's a nice black drawing pencil. Um, and yeah, I believe other brands have similar, similar um, pencils as well. So um, as I'm going through now, I'm observing how there's generally a dark rim around here, but it's not a sharp edge. It's a little bit more sharp on this side uh, than it is on this side. And in general, it's darker on this side here than it is on this because of that light effect of the sphere. So let's see. So I'm going to create that, those darker marks. Um, and as I'm making my marks here, I'm going to kind of radiate out from the center of the pupil, starting to create some textural lines there that I think will help to, that'll serve me in terms of suggesting some of that texture. I'll try to smooth all of this out though. All right, so now what I can do is I'm going to start to put in some of that nice kind of juicy kind of variation in texture. So looking for kind of the, the lines and they make these, again, generally radiating out from the center, but it's not a consistent kind of shape. There's, there's variety. So I'm gonna kind of roll the pencil in my fingers and make some irregular marks there. Now, one of the things we've also talked before when we worked on the eyes is that the structure of the eye is such that the, the cornea is a lens that kind of bubbles out on top of the eyeball. The iris is a cone that angles in towards the pupil. And so when the light comes in at this direction, this highlight is bouncing off the cornea. Um, and then the light is passing through the cornea and striking more on the inside of that cone of the iris. And so typically what you'll see is that you know where wherever the highlight is, the side of the highlight is, the the iris is going to be a little bit lighter 
on the opposite side of that. So I'm going to use my kneaded eraser. Actually, maybe I'll try this to get a sharper edge. I'm just I'm kind of radiating out from the center as I move these marks, but I'm pulling out just a little bit more light on this side. I'm a very light pressure here, just bearing down a little bit more as we come around to that lighter edge. Um, yeah, so I think that's starting to work out okay. And if we need to add a little bit more, we can kind of add a little bit more detail in here to, to bring that, that iris to life. Uh, but I do want to now get into the kind of the eyelashes, um, looking for areas where it's just kind of a more ambiguous form, like right in here. But then you start to see some more distinct eyelashes here. And what I found is that I, I the hair and eyelashes work out better when I use the side of the pencil rather than the, the fine point. I kind of scrape across, pushing and pulling to find it using whatever clues I can uh, observe about the, um, the angle and direction of those eyelashes. Uh, if I look at the lower eyelid, there's far fewer eyelashes, but the, and you, you just be careful not to have them be kind of spaced evenly, like, um, you know, evenly spaced stripes. They kind of come out at different angles. They're different sizes and shapes. Sometimes they cross you know, in opposite directions. I think I want to darken this a little bit more in here, get a little bit more volume to that eyeball. And I need to come in here and darken this. Kind of define that a little bit more. All right, that's reading a little bit better. Um, and so I wanted, now I'm just doing a quick check-in on this edge here in the upper eyelid to make sure that there's sufficient structure to the eye. All right, we're, gonna come, we're, not, we're not done with it yet, but we're gonna come in and, and add some you know, more dimension with the, uh, um, with the white chalk. I don't know what happened there. Oh, there's that dark mark. That does not want to go anywhere, huh? Don't know what that is. All right, but I'm gonna move over to this eye now and kind of apply that same thinking. Uh, I'm gonna let me smooth out some of this texture here. I'm gonna fill in some of that tooth. Again, I'm gonna be looking for that upper, um, that the upper part of the eyeball to be kind of in shadow. Uh, where we have all these eyelashes too, it gets really dark. And I'm gonna try to try to observe this shape specifically. It's really difficult to really see that form because of the eyelashes. Um, if you need to keep your eyes unfocused and really kind of squint through this area. So you don't get bogged down into drawing individual lashes. You know, it kind of looks like I'm, I'm doing that, but I want to make sure I don't lose sight of the, the totality of it and see that, see how that, that upper eyelid, you can see that upper part of the eyelid here comes out in on top. As so we come down here, it kind of falls away and then you're left with this crease right in here. And then right in here as well, this comes in, there's a shadow here that kind of comes out. Diller, the Nero is an oil-based sketch pencil, three hardnesses and water resistant. Awesome, <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, I love working with it. Um, it's really a great tool and I can't quite remember where I got a hold of it. Um, all right, so I'm kind of looking back and forth at the pupil here. 
Copy in the reference photo, making sure that they are generally the same size. How does that look? I think that works out all right. Now there's the, with this side of the head being in more light, the eye is also catching a bit more light, but you can see how dark it gets along this edge. But pay attention to, to that, the sharpness of that edge. It's not a hard line. It's highly visible, but it's not a hard line. I think I, I, think I need to come in a little bit more. This, this highlight, I think, is too large. I think that's gonna work out better. Um, but I'm looking at how it gets darker on that outer edge. Kind of pull into the, into the center. Kind of adding some variation there. But you can, I can really feel it on this eye in particular. You can see, that again, the light coming in from this angle, casting a highlight that's bouncing off the cornea. Um, and, but it's illuminating this side of the iris as the inside of that cone. As I darken the area around that highlight, that will help to um, really make that highlight pop when we come into it. Uh, I think I need to adjust this shape a little bit. Diller, thank you for that comment about powering through the ugly duckling stage. Whew, I have to tell you, that's in, it's, in, it's intimidating. <laughs> but I have to remind myself that, you know, like, you know, it is what it is. We're all going to, you know, we're all going to go through that. And so I have to, you know, I, I have to live by the advice that I'm suggesting to all of you. Uh, <laughs> it's not easy. So, uh, all right, so I'm just pulling out a little bit of light here using this, this plastic eraser. And I like how it's starting to suggest the, uh, that, that texture, those color variations in the eye. Um, there's, now looking here, that, um, that lower eyelid, I'm trying to observe what's happening here in terms of the value relationships. Um, there's a bit of a turn right here, so it's a little bit darker, and then you get a highlight, and then it kind of falls into some value here. And uh, one of the things that I'm struggling with right now is reminding myself that I'm starting with the, that toned paper, uh, because my brain just wants to keep thinking about this as being white and thinking about this purely as kind of an additive and subtractive process, uh, not necessarily that adding the lights become an additive process in this um, in this drawing. Okay. All right, Ethan, thank you for those comments. All right. I think I do want to drop a little bit of value here. And I want to clarify right in here a little bit more. to find that edge. So I'm using this eraser just very lightly and it's smudging at first and as I, if I need to pull out a little bit more it I just kind of lean in on it, apply a little bit more pressure and that'll start to pull up the material. Okay, I'm just gonna take a, take a bit of a breather. I'm gonna work on some of these other areas where it requires a little less thinking and focus. And I'm gonna jump back into the, 
uh, jump back into the eyeballs and adding those highlights. So we're getting towards the end actually. I'm going to add a little bit more kind of structure. I'm looking for the shapes of the shadows in some of these areas, especially as he has a slight expression that um, is captured in the, uh, the kind of the subtle furrow of the brow. I'm looking for areas where I think I'm needing to pull out some of the lights to right in here. And I'm just lifting off some of the material so that it doesn't blend too much with the white chalk. It's definitely a highlight right in here. So I'm trying to be sensitive with this kneaded eraser and kind of feathering out some of the marks. create a bit of a gradation. It's a highlight here. I've done very little on the nose. This is going to be an interesting thing to interesting to see how it all plays out. And then the the eye the upper eyelid, you can see there's a shift. There's a highlight here and then it falls into slight shadow. And it's hard to see sometimes at first because it all just feels like light, but if you can identify the hot spots, where is it strongest? That can kind of point you in the right direction. All right, let's bring out the white now. All right. Jenny, your nose is broken. Doesn't sound good. Rosalie, a three eye width. Um, yeah, so in general, like if you take the width of this eye, there's about one eye width in between them. So in, his, in his example, it's a little bit wider um, and the eyes are about the same width. So I, I think I might have shifted things over a little bit too much. But I'm going to keep it where it is. Okay. Here's what I want to do. I talked earlier about how this side of the portrait is generally lighter than this. And as you squint or you look at a smaller, real small scale version of the, uh, the reference photo, you can see it more clearly. But I'm using the side of the white chalk and I'm just going to start to bring up this area. And I'm trying to really feather out the marks so that it doesn't become too strong. Uh, and and kind of sneak up on those values. So I'm just using the weight of the pencil at first and if I need more I can kind of lean in on it. And this is where the light source is coming into play. So as I'm looking from my angle here, very little is happening on the page. But I look up at the screen all of a sudden that light is bouncing off. And so I need to be drawing more from the screen in front of me which is a little challenging because there's a, a slight delay. I need to constantly refer to that. So I'm looking to see where those hot spots are and then there's just a very, very subtle transition, a gradation out from that. And I come down here and there's more light on this side of that upper eyelid feathering out. And we're going to come back in and do the, the eyebrows in a bit, but and then it kind of darkens in over here. We come down under here, oh, and there's a really strong light that strikes, it catches right at the turn of that lower, that lower eyelid. And so when I'm, as I'm making these marks, I'm trying to think about where I am in relationship to the iris adding a little bit of texture, a little light catching on a crease up here. We come down here and then light is catching on the inside turn on, on, the, on this. And this is where I think it's really going to help us in terms of creating that, that the likeness, the age. If I, if I make these creases too noticeable, it's going to age the, uh, the subject. And if I don't draw them at all, then we kind of lose some of that opportunity to define that form. I think that's one of the things that it makes drawing children so challenging. I 
is finding that right balance that right balance between the de adding the detail and then overstating that detail. There's the, now the light kind of striking here. So generally the hot spots are at turns in the features. So on the inside of the on the brow of the nose and the inside of that brow, the tip of the nose, the cheekbones. And so as I'm making these marks, I'm trying to be mindful at the end of each stroke to be kind of lifting off the page so I don't end with a hard line. Let me see, do I have a, oh, I do have my clean shading stump here. I have this, this clean one here that I've only used for the chalk and I can use to kind of blend out. Some of that tooth of the paper, tooth of the paper helps to create some texture though, so I don't want to eliminate that altogether. Nia is asking, how do you get the eyes to look like they're facing the camera rather than looking away from it? Um, let me kind of think about that. You know, I, I think for me, what all that I'm doing is really utilizing the, the drawing tools I um, use for most other things, which is, you know, looking at the positive and negative space um, doing some comparative measuring and just if, making sure that it, they're in the right spot. Um, and so it's really, I think what's helpful is to look at this shape here of the whites and that's going to position the iris properly. And as I come under here, I can see the hot spot is really somewhere around here on the bridge of the nose. So I'm using the side of the pencil, kind of applying a little bit more pressure, feathering it out, and it doesn't go down the whole length of the nose. Come down here, it gets a little bit darker, and then we come in here and the, there's the bulb of the nose. Doing a quick check-in to make sure I'm in the right spot. This really kind of grabs the light. I'm using the tooth of the paper to also help suggest the, uh, the texture there. And if I come over to this eye, there's light that catches right in here that's really nice. Right on this little fold in that upper eyelid. And then as with this eye over here, there's light catching at the turn of that lower eyelid as we move from that upper shelf down towards the cheekbone. And then there's light here that's a little bit stronger. So one of the things, if it's challenging for you to figure out where to put the lights, um, I find that sometimes these subtle value shifts are easy to, or easier to observe indirectly. You know, so as I'm looking here, my eyes might be fixed on this spot when I'm looking at the reference photo, but putting my awareness on other areas around it to see what appears brighter in the periphery. That indirect gaze is something that could, can be really helpful to develop um, when you're working, you know, with observational painting and drawing. I'm going to smooth this out here. How's that read? I think that reads all right. Oh, and then right under this nostril, you can see that the light catches here. Again, just keeping those marks really soft. These are really kind of small ellipt elliptical marks that I'm making. So a lot of subtle, subtle things happening in here. So there's a lot where there's just the gray of the paper showing through. Um, and I do want to kind of pull out some more light in this furrow of the brow. So I might bring in some of that light right in here. For example, there's this kind of dimple where you have the shadow and then the light catching on the opposite side of that. So I'm just going to add a little bit of light in here. And then right here on this side. And that works out all right. And that's kind of emphasizing that furrow perhaps a bit too much, so I can kind of tap that out. And this again, where I, from my perspective, I can't really see that highlight, but I see it more strongly from that overhead shot. Because um, right now I can't see any of the light from this angle, but if I look up, I can see it. And so I need to 
soften that a little bit more. All right. And I like the way the light here comes in. You can see where, the, again, with, because of the sphere of the, the eyeball, you know, this area here is catching the light a little bit more. I'll add a little bit there. All very subtle. All right. Now let's get in and add these bright highlights right in here. Working from the center of the form right out to the edge. The same with this one here. I think that really helps pull that together. And then right in here, there's a bit of a highlight couple little ones that help to create that the idea of there's kind of wetness to the eyes right here in the middle that dark spot I need to lift some no I missed it I'm erasing out too much but I'm going to drop this little highlight right in here and then come back in around it and reestablish that. How's that work? I think that works out all right. Um, and now the eyes, the whites of the eyes still seem a little bit flat. So what I'd like to do is add a little bit of light here and then hopefully we'll help distinguish that from the gray area around it. But I don't want to, I don't want it to compete with the highlights that I have. So I need to be very subtle, smooth it out. and creating that contrast, create that spherical form, um, this being a little bit lighter than this side. And if I look here, the light's coming a bit more directly here. So it's, it's a little bit brighter on this side. But there is just a touch of light coming in on this side. And then letting it kind of feather out towards the edge to help to suggest that three-dimensional quality of the, uh, of the eyeball. All right, yeah, it feels like it captures his expression pretty nicely. Ethan's saying my shoe's untied. Not sure what's going on there. I'm going to suggest some of these eyelashes there. And the final thing that's missing now are the eyebrows. So I just want to kind of suggest those. So again, as I mentioned earlier, I like to kind of scrape the pencil along using the side of the pencil. It creates these really nice fine marks. So I'm constantly rolling the pencil in my fingers to try to establish a new edge. And I'm pushing and pulling to vary that edge. And I'm trying to just observe the way those the hairs in the eyebrows, um, how they flow, rather than draw each individual mark, and just kind of like just thinking more gesturally about it. Coming over here, this is a bit lighter, so it's just the weight of the pencil making these marks. I want to thank you all for joining me today. This one was a tough one. <laughs> and I, this is my second attempt at this. It should be easier, but I don't think it was easier, actually. I think it was harder than my first attempt, but that's just the way it goes. Again, I'm not naturally a, a portrait artist, so this is why it's, it's really help, helpful for me to kind of practice this. And I encourage you all to really challenge yourselves by tackling subjects that are you know, just more difficult or that kind of align less with your own sensibilities, um, because you never know, you know, you know, never know what I can apply from this into some of my landscape work. Um, don't give up, you know, so it may be a struggle, maybe it doesn't come together, but, you know, part of that is, you know, some of the, the frustrations we experience are because we have expectations that things are going to come together, and so um, and sometimes those expectations just aren't, aren't met, so...
Again, be kind to yourselves as you're going through this. As you move on to the next drawing, you know, you think about what went well in this one. What can you carry over? You know, what areas can you work on? Work on those for the next one. But ideally, you know, everything, everything you work on will have something that needs improvement. And that's what gets you, keeps you motivated moving on to the next one. There's, you know, there's things here that I feel like oh, I could just do better. Um, you know, especially in some of these outer areas. But I, I think I'm going to let that sit just because we've been together here for a while. I don't want to let you guys go. Um, but, um, you know, for yourself, you may decide just to keep going and really, really render this thing out, add more detail. I'm going to let this all just be unfinished. You know, I feel like the eyes are finished enough that, um, you know, that we can move on and say, all right, this is a good drawing day. Remember, it's about drawing, it's the act of drawing, not necessarily the drawing. You should enjoy the process of drawing. All right. Uh, Aida is saying, did you start with a gray colored paper? Yes, this is a gray toned favorite. Uh, pa pa paper, I just saw the word favorite there. A gray toned paper. Um, all right, so getting some good feedback here. Thank you for these compliments. Um, just looking for other... Uh, oh, Nia is asking, when is it better to use toned gray paper versus gray paper? I don't really know. I mean, I started with the tan toned paper. That's just what I had available to me and I really liked it. Um, you know, I think it can be helpful to use a tan toned paper when that's when you kind of want to con convey a sense of color. And I think in this one though, I think the, the gray aligns with the temperature of the materials a little bit better. Um, so, um, you know, with the, just with the graphite and the white chalk, they're, they're pretty neutral in, in temperature. So it, it works nicely with the gray tone paper. With the tan tone, tone paper, it just has a different effect. But I used it for like, say the pipe early on in this whole series. And that actually helped to convey a sense of, of warmth in the, in the pipe and, and color. So, um, and then uh, Chris is asking about how about working on white paper directly? So that's, if, um, I don't, I'm not sure if you saw the, the portrait we did last week of the older man, that was drawn directly on white paper. And so the choice to use gray paper was actually, uh, uh, came out of that drawing experience when, when that was a suggestion by, from one of you and I thought, that's a great idea. So there are other um, drawings in this series. Uh, other, I think pretty much every other portrait I've done in this Drawing Together series has been on white paper. So you might find it helpful to watch that and see how that might apply to uh, this child's portrait. Um, so hopefully there's some, things, some takeaways from this that will work for you even if you only have the, um, the, uh, the white paper that you're working on. Uh, so Alexis is asking, the, you know, the pencils that I'm using, I really started with just the ebony pencil, and then pretty quickly I shifted to this Nero, and I'm, I've been sticking with this to get the variations in value, and I find that that works for me. I know for some artists, they really like to use the various gradations of the artist material, so, you know, maybe starting with an HB pencil and gradually moving towards darker ones, you know, you know a 2B, 4B, 6B pencils, etc., um, I, I found that it just doesn't really align with my way of working. I like to use pressure to um, create these variations in value, and, and I like to get kind of sucked into the drawing and not have to stop and think about which pencil I'm using unless I'm really dramatically shifting, say, from, from a dark to a light uh, material. But it's the same with when I paint. I often find myself just I grab one brush and end up using that same brush for the whole painting rather than calculating which brush I should be using for which marks. Um, and that, that's just kind of a personal preference um, that, you know, based on what I, I find works for me. So, um, so thank you all. So I think we'll call it quits for the day. I thank you all for joining me. We uh, meet here every Monday, Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. I am working on developing the topics for next week, so I'm not sure exactly what I'm going to be doing, but I know there's going to be more kind of portrait figure work. Um, 
I've had some requests in the past about drawing feet, so that's going to be coming up at some point in the next couple weeks. Um, an additional portrait, because I really want to explore expression a bit more. Um, doing this drawing, um, and when I did the preparatory one, made me realize that there's there's some areas, it's an area in, that, in drawing that I've really not explored, which is how to create expression and capture not just the likeness, but the expression of the sitter. So um, I'm working on developing a, a, finding the right reference photo for that. Um, Adele, jury duty was today, but it was canceled. I'm so excited. So I could actually join you all live today. So <laughs> thank you. I had actually created a recording that was gonna be going out live of this, of doing my preparatory sketch. But when I found out that the, um, that the jury duty was canceled and I could join you all live, I. That's what I did. I find that it's just far more satisfying. I have to just say, like, it, this is, these are highlights in my week doing these live sessions. So I really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Uh, I get a lot of really great feedback. You're all very supportive. I love hearing your observations, um, sharing your experiences. Uh, I feel like my drawing has improved because of you. So I want to thank you all for that. Um, and, uh, Patty is saying landscapes, trees, and grass. Um, actually, I have a couple drawings in the series of painting kind of the, these reeds where we explore creating grass. And then I did one kind of old gnarled tree that you might find interesting. So if you haven't seen that, check that out. So if you go to artistnetwork.com, there's the drawing together page. Um, and so if you go to the homepage, artistnetwork.com, at the very top, you'll see drawing together. You click on that and that takes you to a landing page that lists out all the episodes by subject. So you can find trees, and I think it's a boardwalk one that has the grasses in it. Uh, Joy is asking, what's the difference between charcoal paper and drawing paper? Well, charcoal paper is really designed for charcoal. It generally has more of a tooth to it because the charcoal kind of requires that. It needs something to hold on to, otherwise it just kind of shuffles off. Um, and so a drawing paper can sometimes be more of a universal paper where it has some, enough tooth to hold the charcoal um, but it'll also, it's also a bit smoother, so it works better for graphite and, and other materials. Uh, and so this is a kind of a drawing paper that I find actually works out really well for, for a lot of media. Um, as I build up layers and layers of charcoal, however, it may not be able to hold it quite as much. So you're calling in sick on the landscape one. Do we just did, oh, I did the mountain mist last Monday, on Monday, right? Yeah, so check out the latest one that I did. Um, it was kind of a mountain landscape focusing on atmosphere using these same materials here. Um, and I also, we're also gonna be doing a staircase one that I'm, I'm hoping to get done because it kind of working on perspective, that's an area that I found students have really struggled with in the past and it's been a long time since I've dealt with it. So I, I feel like I, I can really kind of sink my teeth into that. So um, I found an old photo of some, some old stairs that I think would be really helpful. Um, definitely, I definitely wanna do more landscape though because that's really where my heart is at. Um, and so these go up as recordings at the end um, so if you have any additional questions or suggestions, um, feel free to type them into the, um, the chat field on the recording. Invariably, I, mean, I get some that come in right after I sign off, sign off because of the lag here. So, but I don't want to miss any. If, if I do miss your questions, feel free to type them in in the, the, in the chat field, the discussion field underneath the recording. So um, Nia is asking, can we draw a car? Um, car, but I think that sounds like a great idea, Nia. I'm going to give that a shot. All right, some great comments here. Thank you all. It's awesome being with you here today. Have a great weekend. Everybody stay safe and cool. Hopefully everybody's out of fire danger. <laughs> all sorts of craziness happen. So I enjoy it. See you all on Monday.